Welcome to the show. I am James Swanick, and today we are talking to the UK's leading biohacker and the founder of the Health Optimization Summit in London, which is probably Europe's biggest biohacking event. Uh, his name is Tim Gray, and he's a new friend of mine who we met, uh, I guess we met in 2023, and we're here in London, England. And today we're going to be talking about are sunglasses really that good for you? Is putting your bare feet on carpet really that good for you? Which demographic has the shorter, shortest, I should say, lifespan and why? Oat milk, good for you, not good for you? Nail polish, is it harming us? Is it not harming us? All of that and a lot more. Tim, how are you, mate? Great to have you here. Thanks for having me. I have a niece and nephew who have both been diagnosed as having ADHD. <laughs> I would submit that the reason that they are displaying whatever signs that doctors say is ADHD is more to do with their diet mm -hmm. than the fact that they've got ADHD. So just and just to give further context, I see them eating uh, chips, sugary drinks, uh, red cordial, um, energy drinks, um, uh, cornflakes, mm -hmm. breads, orange juice, why are all these foods that I just explained bad for you and how could that lead to what doctors would say are the symptoms of ADHD? Mm -hmm. So there's there's two points on this is nutrition or food, diet, whatever, is one thing that's linked to ADHD for sure. And the second is um, the use of devices and constant stimulation from all angles. For instance, you know, before we had the iPhone or laptop or whatever, you know, we'd be on a bus or in a car or somewhere or other, and we'd be thinking, we'd be looking out the window, we'd be playing I Spy with, if we were in the family car, you know. We wouldn't be having a five-second gap default to Instagram or default to chatting to one of 50 people on WhatsApp. So we're always looking for the next bit of stimulus. And as a result, uh, a dopamine spikes, which then exhausts our system, that makes us keep on hunting for more and more stuff. Therefore, we have less attention. And actually, I noticed on my phone usage, and I, at one point I was using my phone seven hours a day. Mm. And I couldn't focus. I couldn't concentrate. I had to force myself to meditate every day. It was really tough. I couldn't even lie still for five minutes. It was just ridiculous. And the more I've tapered down my use and the more conscious I am with using it, the more my attention has been on track. Uh, you know, when I'm with people, my focus is there. It's not anywhere else. My phone doesn't get picked up if I'm at the dinner table. There's multiple things I set in place. So I think, you know, kids these days are using devices more than, well, especially we did at our age, you know, like we didn't have mobile phones until we were probably 16 or 18, you know, in those days. And we're brought, brought up with an Atari or some games console, not something that's killing and you know, hyper-stimulating you all day, every day. So so that's the one element. But to go back to the food one, I actually recorded a podcast with Dr. Daniel Amen, um, and he has scanned over 250,000 brains with spec scan to see brain health. And, you know, we're not just talking, um, you know, how it's operating, it's the unit itself and how the brain health is. And one of the things that he noticed on these scans is that people that ate processed food had the worst brain health. So what we're saying is, is when there's lots of influencers or industry saying, actually, no, processed food is fine. We fortify it with whatever. That's bullshit. Over 250,000 scans, you can see the brain health from people that eat processed foods. It's proven. You don't, that's not small data. That's far bigger than most studies that are double blind, even at 50, 200 participants or whatever. And when you look at one of the leading issues that kids have these days, ADHD. But when you see kids that are on a nutritious, natural, plant based, and meat inclusive diet with fish and healthy oils and some good dairy, not the traditional dairy, their brain health is fantastic. In fact, Daniel actually recently released a book exactly on this with 
children's mental health issues and brain health mm. around this. So it's a shame that ADHD is so prevalent these days. It's also a shame that there's so much processed food everywhere, but really it comes from education to parents, such as, for instance, if stroke, when I have kids, hopefully, you know, I know that they will see plants and meat as superfood, as literally to be a superman, and the processed stuff as weak crap that doesn't have any nutrition. And that starts with me. Luckily, you know, unfortunately, my parents didn't give me quite the same advice, but it is what it is. Yeah. But we can do better. When we know better, we can do better. I mean, I just feel so good when I have a breakfast with chicken, eggs, avocado, mm. healthy fats. Mm. When I have a traditional breakfast, say, of cereal, mm. a glass of orange juice, <laughs> toast, I crash. Mm. I mean, I just get so lethargic. I'm foggy, I'm distracted, I'm irritable. And probably an hour after I've eaten that food, I'm now craving more sugary food. Why is that? Like, why is that happening? Mm. It's actually very easy. I mean, if you track your blood glucose, which I often do, you know, with a constant glucose monitor, which connects to your phone, you get to see over a period of time of what works for you and what doesn't. And if you have high carb, high carb so it could be you know cornflakes or anything sugary whatever you'll see that your blood sugar spikes very quickly you know and it's good to have a good response it comes up your body then releases insulin which then puts let's say sugar into the cell um, which then stores it so to bring down your sugar levels in the blood right so every time you eat something you spike and then crash but the thing is because so much insulin goes in you actually go below your baseline of your normal blood sugar level, which then gives you a crash, which is why after a Sunday roast or whatever, you have a crash afterwards, and then you recuperate and you're okay again as your blood sugar comes back up again. What happens is people are yo-yoing all day, every day like this. Now, a spike is no problem, especially if you're a bodybuilder. When you're working out, you eat carbs and protein after a workout. This helps spike your blood glucose, which then supports your muscle repair because of the, the, the benefits of the mitochondria from having easy energy. The thing is, is when you're having it constantly throughout the day, your body is storing it, which then converts to fat. So it's not optimal. What it is good is to actually have a more stable blood sugar with spikes, depending on when your workout are, what your goals are, um, but to keep it stable as possible and higher fat and higher protein. Well, fat doesn't spike your blood glucose, obviously. Protein does a bit because it's slower, breaks down into sugars. But having higher fat and higher protein and lower carbs, but not no carbs, is ideal, especially for me. And I find that the more carbs I actually add in personally, actually the more weight I lose because my body needs carbs as its primary source of energy. Some people I know that need fat more. Mm. And it's very, very interesting. And Obviously, I've seen this on VO2 max testing to see what my body needs at maximum peak output, and it is you know, pretty much solely glucose. So if I don't eat enough carbs, and when I say carbs, brown, brown rice or white rice, white potatoes, sweet potatoes, these things, not carbs in cakes and pastries and <laughs> pasta. Yeah. Um, but as a result, my body operates more efficiently. So to go back to the point of blood sugar spikes is – you want to keep it a nice, smooth blood sugar with occasional spikes, say, after workouts. And if you do have something that's sugary, go for a walk or go and exercise because then you're using up that instead of storing it. Um, and then you find that you won't have the crash so much as a result. There was a book I read called Get Up by James Levine, and he said that if you go for a gentle 15-minute walk immediately after your last bite of food, mm -hmm. that it halves your blood glucose mm -hmm. levels which prevents you from storing unwanted fat and mm -hmm. prevents you from feeling tired and having that crash. Mm -hmm. So uh, every time now that I finish a meal, it's almost like as soon as the, the last bite goes in my mouth, I'm on the clock. It's like I've got to be up and walking within five minutes. Mm -hmm. So I'll, sometimes I'm with friends and they're like, what are you doing? Why are you in such a hurry? I'm like, because I want to get up and walk so I'm not <laughs> storing unwanted fat and getting this, this kind of blood glucose spike, which is going to make me crash later on. Um, I want to go through a few things here that uh, I saw on your Instagram. So we'll just do, do quick fire uh, round here. The 12 companies who control everything we eat. Why 
putting a laptop on your lap could be destroying your efforts at producing children, the danger of removing wisdom teeth, reversing depression, and so forth. So let's do a quick fire rapid round here. Okay, so why is sitting down with a laptop on your lap bad for you? Okay, so this is an easy one. EMF from Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, whatever. Um, historically, they said that non-ionizing radiation is non-damaging, and so therefore it's not a problem. However, there is more and more research coming out showing that ionizing, non-ionizing radiation is damaging to us. Now, there's a lot of people with electric sensitive, electromagnetic sensitive sensitivity. For instance, if they turn their Wi-Fi off at night and t- put their phone on airplane mode, they sleep better. Or if they put a Wi-Fi router next to their bed, then they sleep worse. Um, often it's people that have had higher levels of mercury and arsenic and metals in their system that are more metal sensitive, uh, electric sensitive. But the point is, is we are electrical creatures. You know, and when our heart stops, we have electricity to get it. Our heart starting again. Our bodies are electrical. Our veins are full of blood, which carry oxygen around, and electrolytes, which are part of our wiring system. Electrolytes being minerals. We're electrical creatures, and to think that the electric from a device isn't affecting us in any way is ridiculous. Now. Apparently, when you have metal fillings and you have a phone next to it, the temperature of the filling goes up two to three degrees. Okay, now there's also a study showing that having metal fillings acts as an antenna for Wi-Fi as well. It tracks the Wi-Fi. Mm. Actually, my colleague and friend, Dr. Dom Nischwitz, who's the biological dentist from Germany, um, actually has shared some content around this exact study. So anyway, Wi-Fi interferes with how our body works and often with our cellular water. Um, would be the, the one of the main ways. And having it on your lap has been shown to reduce fertility in men of having this electric sitting next to your balls the whole time. So I'm very conscious of it. It's the same with having your phone in your pocket, which I've actually got some content being done on at the moment around this, and like not walking around with the phone in your in your pocket next to your balls the whole time. And in fact, Dave Asprey actually used to wear, or I don't know if he still does or not, um, combats and he would have his phone pocket in near his knee. And um, he was saying that it actually hurts with bone density. Um, so you can actually see, and that is something to do with the calcium channels um, and how, how um, yeah, bones degenerate when they have too much EMF. Amazing. I put my phone in my back pocket. Would that be okay? Is that better or is it still, is it equally bad? I mean, I th- personally, I think it's better, better. It's better but, but not ideal. I mean, if you put it on air, airplane mode, then yeah. I think it's better. Um, so yeah, so I, having it on your lap is probably one of the worst places you can have it. Um, but you can actually get like a EMF protecting mat that goes on your lap and then you put it on top of that. Got it. Perfume. What's wrong with women's perfume? <laughs> they can have like 190 different chemicals that they don't have to list and you know a lot of them aren't good and they include things like propellants as well to make the scent travel and last for longer and we just don't know what's in it and you know half the people are spraying it straight on their thyroid on their neck area and, and then getting thyroid issues it's like the, the the thyroid just can't cope with it so breathing in these chemicals all day every day is actually really bad for for us um especially when we don't know what these chemicals are and a lot of them don't have to be you know and uh, we don't they don't have to disclose it there are a couple of cleaner brands out there there's one that actually exhibits at my summit that i found a while ago called meadow m-e-d-e-a-u which is natural natural uh scents which are great but traditionally it's an awful industry and if you walk into somewhere like house of fraser or debenhams or macy's or whatever you'll walk in and you'll get hit by the smell and a lot of people you know start coughing or feel funny as soon as you walk into perfume stores just because there's so many thousands upon thousands of chemicals and then when you're spraying it on yourself and breathing it all day every day or spraying it on your thyroid and expect your thyroid to be able to cope you, you know it's, it's, it's bonkers so i avoid it Find it where possible. I mean, sometimes I use essential oils and sometimes I use meadow, depending on what the occasion is. Big shout out to an Australian brand that I'm fond of uh, called Yusei, Y-U-S-E-I dot com dot A-U. Friends of mine run that and it's uh, fragrance free, all natural. Uh, KFC chicken. What's wrong with the chicken at Kentucky Fried Chicken or KFC? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, 
I always used to think that KFC was the healthy one before I was healthy, thinking it's just chicken. But really, yeah, not only is it deep fried in seed oils, which have been probably used hundreds of times. Um, so it's um, massive for oxidative stress, really bad for gut health. Also, the fats that we eat or consume um, help make up our cell membranes. And cell membranes ensure that nutrients get in the cell or toxins get out of the cell. So if you have a dodgy cell membrane made up of dodgy fats, how's your health going to be? Mm. Now, it's massively inflammatory, this, the seed oils. That's the first thing. Second thing is, is that the chickens, they're, they're really raised inhumanely. And, you know, they are, to be fair to KFC, working on making it better because the publicity for them was pretty bad. But the thing is, it's not healthy chicken. And if you want to be healthy, you want to eat healthy food, healthy animals, healthy plants. You don't want rotting stuff or stuff that isn't healthy. What makes the chicken unhealthy? The way that the, the way the, that it's fed, the way that it's kept in tiny conditions, the way that they're like malformed, like they're not like deformed creatures, some of them, and just really badly looked after or not looked after at all. So the quality of the chicken, the quality of the oils, and generally it's just junk food. And if you look at, you know, things like their burgers and things like that, or you know, all of their ketchups and which is really high in sugars and it's just basically junk. You know, if you were to have some, you know, just plain chicken breast, why? It's, it's more than enough. If you're going out to the supermarket and you're looking for a humanely raised chicken and a healthy chicken, like mm -hmm. chicken breast, what should one look for? I mean, the, in the UK, the, the standard is going for organic um, because it comes with certain assurances when it's an organic chicken, for instance. Um, you know, better still is going to a farm raised, you know, like a, a farm or wild raised chicken which is significantly better, but the cost obviously hikes up quite a lot. So going with organic is, the good, is a good start. What would you say to people who say, I can't afford organic? <laughs> I mean, it's a very good point. What do you afford, though? Like, what else do you spend your money on? Because when I look at people that say that they can't afford to buy healthy stuff and that, you know, I'm privileged to buy this good stuff. So, I, well, actually, when you look in these people's shopping baskets around the supermarket, you'll see that they're buying bags of crisps worth five quid or, you know, like cakes that are 12 quid or packet meals that are 15 quid when they could buy the ingredients for half that. So it's like, where are you diverting your money to? And I understand if people don't earn enough, you know, on benefits and things like that, you know, you have to pick wisely and you should pick some of the best things that are non-organic. Like, for instance, some of the worst are strawberries, blueberries and raspberries. In fact, you have for pesticide levels, so you want to buy those organic regardless. But you know, obviously buy to your budget, but just do the best you can. The thing is, is if you're eating processed food, it's definitely almost definitely not organic and you're going to get all the crap in it anyway. At least if you're buying vegetables and meat and fruits, even if it's not organic, you're significantly going to be in better place for eating natural foods than processed crap anyway. So I would say start with eating natural, mm. buy organic where you can. And if you say you can't afford it, and then I would question, why can't you afford it? I would say you're either going to pay for your health now or you're going to pay for it later. Mm -hmm. That's the way I always <laughs> remind myself when I'm making a decision as to whether to buy organic and super healthy or not. Mm -hmm. Based on the cost, I always say, well, I can pay for it now or I can pay for it with poor health later. So I am exactly. think I'm going to choose paying for it now. Pay the farmer now or pay far big farmer later. Yeah, yeah, yeah I like that. I agree. I agree. Uh, what's wrong with putting our bare feet on carpet? <laughs> well, carpet's not so bad. Um, but really what is bad is carpet in general because it harbors loads of dust and loads of like, the, the, it's generally made from poor chemicals actually, like polyester and things like that these days. So you've basically got a house full of chemicals and that harbors lots of bacteria and dust mites and blah, 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 blah. So that's the thing with carpets, but and also they can get mouldy, and um, which is really bad for health, very very bad for health, and causes hormone disruption, and um, various other things. But the bigger problem is more if you have hard flooring such as laminate flooring or tiles, because you know you're using floor cleaner, which is some of the strongest chemicals that there are, 
on the floor and then you're walking around barefoot absorbing these chemicals in via your feet. And our feet sweat. Our feet sweat a lot. And that's to help us connect with the ground so we get a better connection with the grounds. Because the feet are very porous and sweat quite a lot, walking around on highly toxic chemicals, especially if it's your kids on their hands and feet and then they're putting their hands in them, you're basically giving them cancer-causing chemicals. So what do we do to combat that if we have carpet or we have tiles? There are, well, carpet, I mean, I would say try and lose it, to be quite honest, but in cold countries, I appreciate it's more important. Um, I would say make sure that it's a, a good a good one that's clean, natural, if possible. Um, with regards to the hard flooring, I would say that buy as clean and natural as for, floor cleaner that you could possibly buy. You know, there's several brands out there. There's one in the UK I like, which is called Green Sense. Um, and also there's EcoMate as well in the UK. Over in the US, is Jessica Alba's company uh, the honest company? Are you familiar with it? I'm not it? familiar with it. No, yeah, no. I think they do pretty clean mm. natural products. Mm. Yeah, I might just want to check that. Mm. To the, to I mean, the there's some good detergent, laundry detergent brands as well that, you know. That you know any working. over in the US? Um, there's, I think it's Molly Suds or something or other like that over there, okay. actually. But but yeah, so, <laughs> I mean, I would say just avoid avoid the nasty cleaners. I mean, you can use apple cider vinegar, actually, um, for floor cleaning, which is fantastic stuff. Apple cider vinegar seems like a bit of a super products really because you can drink it in the morning to suppress your appetite as i understand it Mm -hmm. you can put it on warts or something on your skin to try to heal skin Mm. conditions Mm. uh i think you can rinse your mouth out to try to kill germs with it you can do it to get stains out of carpet it's pretty damn good right Mm -hmm. yep it's amazing stuff and yeah. it's really good for gut bacteria as well and helping your gut gut flourish. And it's really yeah. good for digestion and it's good for killing off parasites. And yeah. it's great for everything. It's cleaning screens, it's cleaning floors. You know, it's a, it's a really is an amazing, amazing, uh, amazing yeah. thing to have is apple cider vinegar. Apple cider vinegar. Uh, on your Instagram page, it said toilet tissue. There was some problems with loo roll, toilet paper, toilet <laughs> tissue. What's the problem? You really have done your research, haven't you? Um <laughs> problem is is that toilet paper is bleached and has quite a few different chemicals in it and that bleach you're wiping on a very 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 sensitive area of your body that is very absorbent (laughs) you shouldn't be wiping bleach on that and um yeah there's there's multiple other chemicals in it and i can't remember off the top of my head the names of them but we can put them in the show notes but basically, yeah, it's a very intimate, sensitive area, and we should not be wiping our bits with it. I mean, you know, whoever invented toilet roll was an idiot, to be quite honest. And I think they did the world a disservice because if you spill something, you don't just use tissue paper to wipe it up, you know, and that's if it's not necessarily something dirty, but this is one of the dirtiest areas. And yet we just use paper to wipe it off. I think you know B days uh, should be more prevalent uh, in the in in the UK in America actually. You know, obviously in the Eastern world it's much more popular. And I think for pollution wise alone, with all the the bleach and chemicals going into the sewage system, I mean it's just just seems crazy. Is there a brand of toilet tissue that you would recommend? Yeah, there's a brand in the UK called Bamboo, uh, and and there's another one called Cheeky Panda, and they're actually um, bamboo bamboo based and bamboo grows very quickly so it's very sustainable and it's not bleached and none of the chemicals on and you know it's not individually wrapped rolls like some of the luxury brands and not in plastic it's in paper and blah 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 so it's actually very very good this is non-negotiable for me actually but also you know there's female intimate products as well such as you know sanitary towels and tampons in fact you know um there's so many different chemicals um i think it was rayon and bleaches in tampons specifically in the leading brands which are causing you know imbalances in the vagina which is causing utis and cystitis and um you know uh, period pains and then when they swap it out to an organic non-bleached version funnily enough all these issues go Mm. so it's the same with tissue paper and with intimate products as well so if you're in the u.s and you're listening and you want to find a, a healthy or at least a not unhealthy toilet tissue, look for bamboo-based paper. Yep. And if you're a woman for female products, tampons, pads, things like that, they should be looking for organic, what? Organic and natural. Okay, got it. There's quite a lot of brands out there now. 
Okay, milk. Let's talk about milk. Oat milk, <laughs> almond milk, full cream milk, skim milk, pasteurized milk, non-pasteurized milk. Which of those milks are the best for us down to the worst for us in your opinion? <sighs> Big dramatic sigh. Um, I think that the milk industry has become a bigger industry of not dairy based and dairy based. And it's an industry that people try to sell their products and it's processed food. Oat milk. Well, oats are meant to be digested. When they're ground down and turned into a milk, your blood sugar spikes the same as if you drink a can of Coke if you have oat milk wow. in your coffee. So it's like drinking a coffee with cola in terms of sugar load. Okay, Drinking oat milk. Oat milk, yeah. There's that big brand, famous brand, Oatly. Uh-huh. <laughs> so obviously that's a no. That's a, yeah. that's a hard pass. It's crapply. Um, crapply. It's yeah. Oatly, it's crapply. Uh, it's, it's not good. Um, so... Yeah, so oat milk is, you know, it's if you don't care about sugar spikes and if you don't care about extra weight and whatnot, oat milk is a, is a sweet alternative, uh, but I avoid it um, most of the time. Um, almond milk, almonds, I mean, I don't do too well with oxalates specifically because of my kidney stone history in the past, so I like to avoid oxalates because external oxalates and endogenous oxalates combine and cause an issues for me so i avoid that um the problem is is that a lot of these milks milks have sunflower oil or rapeseed oil or any other additives in there and there's a few good brands like plenish in the uk that actually is just for instance coconut milk and water or almonds and water or oats and water so it's and mineral and salt so I would avoid the plant-based milks wherever possible just because, you know, and also like almonds are very not sustainable. I mean, it's really bad for the planet. It's really bad for wildlife and the farming of almonds and nuts in general is pretty bad industry, to be quite honest. Oats, um, because they're very quick carbs and for sugar. And then when we talk about traditional dairy, like, the way that dairy started was there's an animal. It gives out more milk than we needed. Let's have it because it's a good food. You know, when we're born, we breastfeed because we have good bacteria and the right hormones in the milk from our mum to help us grow and populate our gut bacteria. We then have adopted using cows and that's fine to some extent. The problem is, is now because industry and shipping and supermarkets and things, we have to pasteurize and homogenize the milk to kill the bacteria off, which also kills off the enzymes that help us break down the milk. And then our guts don't know what to do about it. So more and more of us are getting lactose or dairy intolerant. And that can be down to A1 protein, A2 protein or lactose. So when the milk isn't pasteurized or homogenized, and this is what we call traditional raw dairy, you have the enzymes in it that helps you break down the milk so you don't get the same lactose issues or the A1 or A2 protein issue. And after a while of having this, and I've been using it now for three years straight, I get it delivered every week, and I have two litres of it a week. It's helped me repopulate my gut significantly. And I can now have traditional dairy from time to time without it affecting me. So it reversed my lactose intolerance and all my dairy issues from having raw milk. So I would say avoid traditional factory farm milk also because factory farms pump their cows full of hormones to make them give more milk off and antibiotics to keep them from getting sick and then you're drinking that in the milk. Whereas if it's a raw, natural milk straight from the farm where you know the farm is ethical and clean, then it's a very different thing. One is a processed food of some description and the other is completely natural. There seems to be some stigma around drinking unpa unpasteurized milk. Mm -hmm. I, I ordered some unpasteurized milk from a Colombian farm when I was in Medellin, Colombia recently. It was absolutely delicious, mm -hmm. I have to say. And I offered it to a couple of friends of mine who were with me at the time. And they were like, no way, I don't want to catch a virus. Are you kidding me? No way, I'm going to get sick. I'm not touching mm -hmm. that. What's that? 
What's the thought process behind that? I think the statistic is you're 10 times more likely to get food poisoning from chicken than you are from raw milk. Mm. Kind of says it all. So are you going to avoid chicken for the rest of your life? I don't think you will. People that say, I don't want to get sick or this, oh, I know someone that got sick from having raw milk. Yeah, I also know someone that's died from parachute uh, from parachuting doesn't mean that it's a, a dangerous thing. It's one of the safer sports these days. <laughs> and like, it's the same with raw dairy. It's like you always hold on to the bad examples and then people are just scared. So if they want to avoid it, f- feel free, avoid it. It's no loss to me. The point is, is you're ignorant to actually the benefits of the milk and the statistics behind how bad or good they are. Nail polish. What's wrong with nail polish? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's loaded with chemicals it goes onto our skin we breathe it in in fact i think i'm trying to remember the statistic on it but nail technicians were significantly higher in birth defects in children um from nail technicians so there's like there's a lot of chemicals in it i think it's formaldehyde is one of the the main ones and various other toxic chemicals and also it's not just you know it is it it makes contact with the skin and we're breathing it in as well so uh, it's pretty dangerous stuff. There are some cleaner brands out there. I can't remember off the top of my head because I don't new, use them too much. <laughs> <Use them myself. laughs> You're not using nail polish, Tim? Yeah, no, Come on. Not, not anymore. What um, should someone look for in packaging to see whether the nail polish is natural or whether it's damaging to us? Uh, I would just do your research on each individual brand and okay. just to see what they say. I mean, the ones that are ethical that want to be cleaner do generally specify it, and the ones that just avoid it completely are the ones that aren't. So. Okay. Toothpaste, there must be a brand that you are for and a brand that you are against and why? Colgate against. <laughs> Colgate. Or Sensodyne or any of these mainstream brands you see in the supermarkets because they're packed with fluoride and people say, oh, fluoride's safe. It's not. It is known to lower IQ in children by up to 10 points um, and it's a byproduct of the fertilizer industry and they needed to know where to put it. So they put it into the water supply and they put it into toothpaste because apparently once upon a time, people say it helps with your teeth. Now it can help with teeth. You're right. But there is a natural alternative called hydroxyapatite, which is actually part of making the, the teeth structure stronger and it's natural. And so the brand that I do like is super teeth. It's called, you can get it at get super teeth. I think it is, which has hydroxyapatite prebiotics probiotics and helps remineralize your teeth so that if you do have cavities and stuff you can help reverse them because that's what hydroxyapatite does so yes i remember i grew up in uh, victoria in australia and my mum used to say oh you're very lucky james because i got fluoride in the water here <laughs> and then as i grew up i started to get some fillings and i have some teeth issues and i'm like but mum, you told me that fluoride in the water was good for my teeth what happened And of course, the indoctrination, I think, of my Mm. mum back in the 70s was that fluoride in the water and fluoride in the water supply was great for your health, was great for your teeth. But now you're submitting that we've come to realise that actually fluoride is not great for us. It's not. It's definitely not. No, it's definitely not. And, um, you know, it was even in Parliament you know, about a year and a half ago, talking about the dangers of fluoride in Parliament. And yet, you know, people are still saying, no, it's completely safe. And again... Same problem with the dentists. If they've been telling people to use fluoride all these years and, in fact, it's been harming them, what's that going to do to the psychology of the dentists? It's not going to be good for them and to admit that they've been wrong this whole time. But unfortunately, or fortunately, hydroxyapatite is the real deal. It's the natural thing and we don't have to use fluoride. So even if fluoride was, it's still a risk. So why would you not minimise the risk and go with the healthy alternative? Receipts. I go and order a coffee, they give me a receipt. I go and buy a product, they give me a receipt. I'm putting my fingers on this receipt, I'm sticking it in my back pocket. What is wrong with just the traditional normal receipt? The problem is normal paper receipts with ink isn't too much of an issue. Um, ink is can be, cannot be. But when it's heat printed tea, till receipts, so it's where it comes through the till and it's, it doesn't use ink, it uses heat to make the receipt, the words go darker, you know, um, that has uh, BPA in it. So we are, our hands are porous, we're touching it, BPA, obviously the chemical in plastic, which is a hormone disruptor. Um, and we're touching it all day, every day. And then probably putting the fingers in our mouth as well. So we're eating BPA. And then apparently, I think it was one receipt has, from touching one receipt has the equivalent to six months of drinking from plastic bottles or something. Wow, crazy that's like incredible. That. So, so what do you do when they offer you a receipt? 
I leave it on the side <laughs> so or, you... or, or pick it up very <laughs> gently like this and put it into my pocket like this. And like, I, you know, generally avoid wherever possible. Or nowadays, like, you know, you're shopping in Nike and in Selfridges and, you know, like, how do you want your receipt? It's like, put your email address in here. Cool. It's emailed. So now I just have it like that. So you'd rather get spanned from them by having your email address than and actually touch the physical receipt. For sure. For sure. Sunglasses. Why should we not be wearing sunglasses or certain sunglasses? Because everyone thinks, oh, great, sunglasses are going to protect my eyes from the sun. What's the problem with that? Okay. Controversial. Very controversial because, you know, opticians say that I'm full of shit and there's not enough science. However, there is. It's just where you look and how you determine, how you, um, you know, unravel it. If you think about this laptop for a second here, and for those of you listening in the podcast, not watching, I'm having my hand in front of my my MacBook Air. It has a retina display and it has a camera on it, which senses the light around the laptop so that it dims the screen when it's nighttime and it brightens it up when it's in sunlight. Mm -hmm. Okay, It adjusts the behavior of the device to the lighting around it. Okay, What do you think our eyes do? When it's a bright day, our pupils go smaller to let less light in. And when it's dark, our pupils go bigger to let more light in. Our body knows how much light and how much UV there is around us at any given moment. Okay. So much so that when there's blue light, as we know, it stops us secreting melatonin. And then when blue light goes, we start secreting melatonin. Our eyes are smart. In fact, our bodies are smart. Now, if it's a sunny day, your eyes say, it's sunny, I need to adjust my defense systems to make sure that my body is prepared for this higher level of UV. So if you put sunglasses on and you tell it it's nighttime, your eyes think it's nighttime, but your skin does not. And you get burnt more easily. And when I heard this, I was like, sounds logical, but it's probably not real. By reducing or removing seed oils from my diet and by stopping wearing sunglasses and don't get me wrong I love sunglasses I think they are a brilliant fashion accessory they can make anyone look cool <laughs> I loved my glasses however when I changed those two things my sunburn stopped they wow. no longer burn now I would burn in five to six minutes when I was sick and I had my gut issues and I'd eat seed oils now I can spend as much time in the sun you know as much time as I as I like, up to UV seven, seven and a half without burning. And 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 that's pretty much indefinite. When I was in India, I was very careful, obviously, because I didn't want to be foolish and you should always respect the sun. Always respect the sun. You know, the other thing is, is that we evolved in natural light with some clothes on, but not in a fake lit office for 50 weeks of the year and then two weeks in the sun where our body is not prepared for it. So if you have natural light exposure throughout the year, your body's defense systems are good. If you don't wear sunglasses, your body's defense systems are even better, and then you don't get burnt as much. So I'm against sunglasses for those reasons. Now, reading glasses. Now, I've recently been prescribed reading glasses, and I'm working on fixing my eye health, actually. It's a really interesting speaker at the Health Optimization Summit in a few weeks' time talking about the eye-gut eye axis, actually. The thing is, is there's um, a guy called John Ott, and he wrote a book called Health and Light, or Light and Health, something like this. And he was tasked with growing a pumpkin for Disney for uh, Cinderella or whatever, where you could see it from a seed growing all the way up and then shriveling back down again over years. And it was photographed around the clock for every half an hour for years. Problem is that they found that because the flash was flashing at nighttime to take a photo of this pumpkin, it would interfere with its circadian rhythm, even the plant. So the plant didn't grow properly. And they found that if they put different color of glass or perspex over the plants that they were growing, such as corn, it would stop them growing so high, or some of them would be grow higher, or some of them would get sick. And then when they put natural light to them, actually it would kill the viruses off and they would actually flourish. From different glass in front of the plant. Now, our eyes get sunlight into them or natural light into them, which helps determine our hormone balance. So if you are cutting out certain 
wavelengths of light. Your body doesn't know truly what the light is and your hormones can be a bit imbalanced. So it's best to not wear glasses as for as much possible as much as possible. Obviously for reading I or for or close things like this I have to right now. Mm. So yeah, I'm against sunglasses, reading glasses, any of these things for the majority of the time and, you know, get natural light in your eye as much as you possible can, possibly can. Yeah, fascinating. Mm. All right, so we're heading for home here. It would be remiss of me if we didn't talk about alcohol, given mm. I have a stop mm. drinking business where we help executives and entrepreneurs to have a better relationship with alcohol. Um, I'm not sure if I shared this with you last year, but um, the University of Washington did a scientific study on our stop drinking process, mm. and it showed a 98% reduction in drinking, mm. which is pretty amazing. Um, alcohol, what do you know? Tell us what you know about how bad alcohol is for us, and is there any safe consumption? Uh, is complete abstinence the best route? Is it okay to have a drink a day? What do you know? What do you think about alcohol? Once heard a saying, which I'm going to share. Doctor, doctor, I want to live forever. Okay. Do you drink? No. Do you smoke? No. Do you eat any crappy foods? No. Do you go skydiving? No. Do you have unprotected sex? No. Why do you want to live forever? So there's an element that, yes, drinking is bad. Alcohol is bad. Okay. It is toxic to our liver. In fact, it's so toxic, it makes us do funny things. This is why we get drunk. Our body just doesn't know how to deal with it. It's very strong on the liver. For instance, you know, we know that alcoholics have, you know, fatty liver and so many different, uh, so many different health issues as a result of the liver always struggling to deal with it. It also kills off the bacteria or bacteria in our mouth and in our guts. Um, and people that, for instance, I know on my own data is when I drink, I see my heart rate is increased by 15 to 20 beats a minute through the night. And my heart rate variability tanks to almost, you know, nothing shows that it's a stress on the body. And then my recovery score, and I don't feel so good the next day as a result. There's multiple reasons why not to drink it. You know, also you can see how water retention is on people and how it ages people. And, you know, it really does speed up the aging process. However, drinking from time to time, I don't have a problem with, you know, I, I may drink once a month, sometimes once in six months, sometimes, you know, for instance, I was, I recently started dating again and I had uh, three dates in a week and uh, I drank three nights, just one drink, you know, but I didn't beat myself up for it. I was just, I know that it's not something I want to get slip. I don't want to slide into too much. So I think there's an element of enjoying your life. And if enjoying your life is significantly better without alcohol, then don't drink. And if for sometimes you like to let your hair down, then fine. Like for instance, when I was at my sickest, I didn't drink for two years, not a single drop of alcohol for two years because I was so sick. And I remember thinking, I wonder what it's like to be tipsy. Like I remember, like I do actually miss like being able to unwind and not give a shit about my health for two minutes. And I was hyper alert and I was like hyper stressed about it. And I went out and had a few drinks one night with my cousin. And I remember walking home and I was, I was just so relaxed. And I was just like, actually, I've been so stressed about not doing it that I didn't do it. And now I've done it, I feel more relaxed and I can take control of my health even more so. So it was an element of relaxing into it. But I think for the long term, if you're doing it regularly, not a good idea. However, Ben Greenfield, um, our mutual friend and colleague, he talks about microdosing alcohol you know, maybe one glass a day um, because it's a hormetic stressor and actually how it can have some health benefits. Personally, it's not for me and I can understand his logic, but I don't necessarily agree with that view myself. Nor I. There was a study 2022 out of the UK of 35,000 middle-aged Brits and it showed that even one seemingly innocent drink per day was enough to cause some grey and white matter degeneration in the brain and that was just one modest drink a night that's seven standard drinks a week only and so i look at that and i go well that means that nightly glass of wine not only is it disrupting your sleep and causing you irritability and fogginess and lethargy the next day but it's also causing some level of brain degeneration mm. now how much 
brain degeneration, I'm sure, differs from person to person. But if a if a scientific study of 35,000 middle-aged adults shows that mm. one drink a night causes some level of brain degeneration, I say mm. that is reason enough to just give it up completely. Mm. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And if you would like to follow Tim on social media, you can find him on Instagram at Tim Biohacker. Anywhere else you are on social media? Uh, t- Instagram is perfect. Yeah, Instagram, Tim Biohacker. Tim, thank you so much for sharing your guidance and wisdom today. Any final words to our listener about biohacking, general health? No. Nothing. Good. I think today has been action packed with loads of, loads of stuff. But follow me on Instagram if you want to know some more some more details on what to do. Yeah. Thanks, Tim. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me.